Hi. In my last video, I reviewed this Hentac TO1204D 4-channel portable oscilloscope with built-in DMM and function generator. I have been using it for a few days, and I have to say, I like the oscilloscope implementation, and it certainly can be used as your day-to-day -day oscilloscope, especially given its 200 MHz bandwidth. Anyway, if you have not watched that video, you can follow the card above or the link in the video description below and check that out. In this video though, we're going to open it up and take a look inside. All right, it's pretty easy to open. There are just a lot of screws. You can see the unit was essentially secured by these four rubber feet and each side has four screws. So we actually have 16 screws just to hold the case together. Then also I had to remove the back cover. You can see there is a speaker on the back instead of a buzzer. And that's all there is on the back side. Indeed, you can see that the scope is powered by four of these 18650 2.6 amp hour lithium ion batteries. They are essentially in parallel, but each battery is independently managed and all four anodes are connected together. Let's actually measure the current consumption first, as the manual didn't mention the expected runtime. And now I have powered it on. It is in oscilloscope mode. You can see we're drawing about 1.4 amps. So that roughly translates into about four hours of runtime, which is fairly decent. And let's change it to different modes to see if the current draw is different. So let's change it to DMM mode. We're still drawing 1.4 amps. Let's change to arbitrary waveform generator. It doesn't seem that the current draw is dependent on the range here. Let's go back home here and let's see if we can change the display setting to see if the brightness has anything to do with the current draw. And let's uh, go back here. And of course it's upside down, but uh, let's change the brightness here. And let's see. Oh yeah. So if you want uh, the battery to last a long time, you have to really dim the display here. You can see at the dimmest, we're drawing about 1.1 amps. And at the brightest, we're drawing about 1.5. So at the default brightness, we're roughly drawing about 1.4 amps. And now we're measuring the standby current. It is at roughly 0.14 milliamps. And given this discharge rate, the batteries included would be completely drained with about two years. So this is actually acceptable. On the left side of the board, that's our digital multimeter section. The DMM chip used here is a CS7721CN. It looks rather familiar. Aha, it is actually the same DMM chip used in the Hentec 2D72 handheld oscilloscope. Not only Hentec used the same DMM chip, they actually used an almost identical design, including not use a fuse for the amp range measurement. If you look at the layout here, you will see we actually do have a 7 milliohm surface mount resistor here. And this is the amp range current shunt. In a gross overcurrent scenario, this resistor would likely to be fused and hopefully will spare the rest of the circuit. The problem though is that you can't easily recalibrate the amp range if you change the shunt resistor. And in this case, not including a fuse is inexcusable as unlike the 2D72, the board here actually has plenty of space for a proper fuse if they reroute some of the components here. Anyway, obviously the DMM chip is a 4000 cons one, and by the look of it, it relies on these two trim pots for calibration. In my opinion, they could have easily upgraded the DMM chip to a more capable one. Now I'm looking at it, I think the DMM section implementation is actually worse than that in the 2D72. Because in 2D72, we at least have some isolation slots around the input jacks. And on this board, we don't. There is not a whole lot of input protection going on. All we have is this PTC and a polyfuse here for the milliamp current range. So yeah, for electronics work, it is okay, but I would definitely stay away from high voltage and high current measurement with this unit. On this side, you can see we have quite a few of these DC to DC converters. And my guess is that they are used to generate the different power rails needed by the FPGA. From a silk screen, you can see this is a V1 version of the board, and we do see a couple of these Bosch wires on the board. 
Either they were not able to route the traces or there is some issue with the routing here. Towards the top here, we have an MSP430 FR2355 microcontroller. And next to the USB port, we have two of these RS2227 double pole double throw USB multiplexers. Now, I don't know why Hentai has removed the markings on these couple of chips. That's really unfortunate. And given we have a windbound memory chip here, this chip here is probably a microcontroller or an FPGA. And remember, the speaker plugs into this connector, and next to the speaker, we have an LM4890, which is a audio amplifier, which is not surprising. I just flip the board over, you can see there's not a whole lot going on on the back side here. And if you recall, we have four batteries right around this area on the other side of the board. And we mentioned that each battery is individually controlled. And here you can see the controlling circuitry here. And this essentially consists of a op amp, a MOSFET, and a current sensing resistor. And these are on the cathode side. And towards the middle section here, we have a TPS65150, which is an LCD driver that provides the bias for the LCD. And here we have another Bosch wire. I do like these brass multimeter sockets though. All right, now moving on to the bottom board. This scope utilizes a two board design. This bottom side of the board is the main board for the oscilloscope. Let me just adjust it so you can see it a little bit better. On this side, you can see we have four of these shielding cans for the input channels and the arbitrary waveform generator. Now it is a little bit interesting as we have four channels, but we only have four shielding cans as we do have one output that is for the arbitrary waveform generator, which is here. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. To the upper left, you can see we have three more DC to DC converters. Interestingly, the marking on this 8-pin chip is sanded up also. I'm not sure why they would do that, because it's fairly easy to deduce what this 8-pin chip is. If you look carefully, you can see one of the traces go all the way from the 8-pin chip to this section here, which is the AWG output. So that makes me believe this is actually an output amp. And if you look more carefully, you will see we also have a pair of traces coming out from this chip to this A-pin chip. Of course, the markings on this chip has also been removed as well. From these two traces though, we can tell that this must be the output differential op-amp that converts a differential signal to a single-ended signal for the arbitrary waveform generator output. And this chip up here, although it doesn't have any markings, it would be the digital to analog converter chip. In the middle section here, we have a couple of these TLV274 general purpose rail to rail op amps and a HT04 buffer chip. Down here, we have an ADF4360 7, which is a synthesizer and a VCO, which works in conjunction with the FPGA. And this chip here with the heatsink, that must be the ADC, shared among the analog input channels. The heatsink was glued on pretty tightly, and I tried to pry it off earlier, but it didn't work. So I'm not going to remove the heatsink as I don't want to damage the IC or the circuit board. According to the manual though, this is a 1 gig samples per second ADC and is shared across all four channels. So the sampling rate halves when two channels are enabled, and it halves further with three or four channels enabled. The FPGA used here is a lemon tree branded one. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information on this chip. Now it appears though it is the same chip used in the Hentec DSO2D10 oscilloscope I reviewed a while ago. And next to the FPGA, we have an EEPROM and a JTAG programming header for the FPGA. Let me carefully flip the board over. On the reverse side of the board, you can see that we really don't have a whole lot going on here. We only have a few of these 595 shift registers. Then I just remove the shielding cans. You can see that actually the shielding cans are for the four input channels. Now they're ever so slightly offset, you can see here. The first channel, the trace from the BNC into the input channel is here, and the second one is shifted over, and the third one, fourth one is shifted further over. So this one is actually the first one here. You can see this first BNC here, that's the arbitrary waveform generator output. As mentioned earlier, you can see the trace all the way going up here into that differential op amps up here. That of course has the marking set it off. 
The input sections are fairly standard. You have a couple of relays for range switching, and you have a solid state relay here, and perhaps some op amps here. Now, interestingly enough, the markings on these 8 pin chips have also been removed. So it seems that they really went into great trouble ensuring that a lot of the chips have the markings removed so you cannot easily reverse engineer the circuit. All right, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. I will catch up to you next time.